Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure we'll have a few more folks coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get the, uh, the panel started today. Um, my name is Don Duncan. I'm the California Director of Americans for Safe Access, and I serve on the Board of Directors. And uh, I'm going to be filling in this uh, afternoon for Robert Jacob. Mayor Jacob could not make it out to Washington, D.C., and so I, I will be giving an impromptu uh, presentation on the state of California. Uh, and then I'll introduce each of our uh, speakers as they come up. I also want to encourage you to see their full bios in the event program. Um, in, uh, in California, medical cannabis has been legal for 17 years now, uh, but uh, we haven't come as far as we need to go in, in terms of regulation. Uh, voters approved Proposition 215 in 1996. The state legislature adopted a, a quasi-regulatory bill in 2003. That was uh, SB 420, uh, which of course we still snicker about uh, in California. Uh, SB 420 established our ID card program, which is voluntary, but really didn't uh, give a great deal of clarity about the scope of protection offered under the state law. And so in California, we have a patchwork of local regulations of cities and counties uh, that regulate medical cannabis, some doing it well and some not so well. And unfortunately, about 200 local jurisdictions that ban medical cannabis outright. Some of the noteworthy ordinances around the state that, are, that we believe are working well are, is, is the program in Oakland, California, uh, that has a very rational, uh, if complicated, permitting process. Uh, San Francisco, where there are no numeric limits on the number of collectives and cooperatives that can operate in the city. Uh, Sebastopol, where Mayor Jacob uh, is coming from, is really a model for, for sensible regulation. And in West Hollywood, uh, we're very proud of an ordinance that uh, actually accommodates low-income patients and, and requires the uh, collectives and cooperatives located there to provide uh, uh, free or, or discounted medicine for low-income patients. We're also really happy to see San Diego coming on board after a very, very long fight uh, for regulations. Uh, city councils have, have done a pretty good job in these jurisdictions of coming up with the right policy. In other places like Los Angeles, after a, a nine-year campaign, the voters finally approved a medical cannabis ordinance. Uh, that, that's tough, but uh, uh, is slowly uh, uh, helping reshape the image and the uh, public perception of medical cannabis in that city. So we've got this, uh, this sort of statewide uh, milieu of, of bans and regulations and voter initiatives. One of the challenges we're dealing with in the state of California that is probably going to come up in other places is uh, uh, our two Supreme Court decisions. One, ban uh, allowing for local jurisdictions to ban storefront access to medical cannabis, and a second decision uh, allowing uh, cities and counties to ban the cultivation of cannabis, and that does include bans on the personal patient cultivation of medical cannabis. Uh, those two rulings really strike at the heart of Proposition 215 and severely uh, uh, limit access for some patients. In California, uh, what we're seeing develop now are access deserts, uh, places of the state where there simply is no access to medical cannabis, and we certainly do not believe that that was the intent of the voters when they approved Proposition 215, nor was it in the intent of the state legislature when they uh, adopted SB 420. And so uh, uh, this is going to be a challenge moving forward in the state of California because some of the uh, rural and southern communities are simply committed to not having medical cannabis in their jurisdictions. And so it'll be, in, in a sense, a sort of wet county, dry county uh, arrangement in California until we get the leadership in the state legislature to, to push back on that. The state legislature, of course, has the authority to do that, but uh, at this point, not the political will. Indeed, uh, even our, our uh, most dogged supporters in the state legislature support the rights of local jurisdictions to ban collectives and to ban cultivation. Now, there is in California uh, uh, some legislative hope. Uh, we have uh, several bi bills currently pending in the state legislature. Uh, two regulatory bills, AB 1894 by Tom Amiano from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, those of you from California uh, may not have seen this past week that AB 1894 seems to have replaced AB 604, the previous regulatory bill from Tom Amiano. And then a, a bill by Senator Lou Correa uh, from Orange County, uh, that's SB 1262. These bills uh, differ in that that uh, the Amiano bill places regulatory control in the Alcoholic Beverage uh, uh, Commission, and the uh, Korea bill places it in the Department of Health. Uh, the Korea bill is supported by law enforcement and cities and uh, uh, has very, very tight restrictions on doctors. In fact, those restrictions are, are so severe that uh, uh, we can't yet support the bill uh, because we're concerned it will choke off access to recommendations for medical cannabis in the state. Uh, the Amiano bill places the uh, regulation in the ABC, which uh, uh, is a matter of opinion, I think, is less desirable, but nonetheless, uh, uh, we would support that bill in its current form as, uh, as a good alternative for state regulations. 
We, uh, uh, we do believe at Americans for Safe Access that the state of California is in compliance with the current federal policy because we regulate at the city and county level, but I think we would all feel much better about our status if we had a state regulatory bill for licensing. And so those are the, uh, the, the, the two competing measures this year that may or may not uh, make it through the long, convoluted California legislative process. I also want to say just briefly about uh, uh, regulation in California that we also have a big challenge with discrimination against patients, uh, discrimination in employment in access to health care, in uh, parental rights, and in uh, um, housing. And so uh, there is an effort uh, afoot right now to criminalize uh, driving with any detectable uh, amount of uh, uh, cannabis in your bloodstream. That's AB 2500 uh, by a Northern California Democrat. Uh, and that bill uh, is, of course, unacceptable because anyone who uses medical cannabis on a regular basis will almost always test positive uh, for THC blood levels. Uh, there's also a good bill, SB 1029, uh, by Lonnie Hancock from the Bay Area, that will uh, opt in public benefits for people convicted of certain drug felonies. Uh, right now, states can choose to provide benefits or not provide benefits uh, available through the federal government based on your status as a, as a felon. And this bill would allow uh, drug felons, including medical cannabis felons, to receive federal benefits like food stamps and, and other family assistance. And finally, uh, there is a proposal on the table by Americans for Safe Access for an organ transplant bill. We'd like to adopt a bill in the state uh, legislature that would uh, make it uh, impossible to deny someone an organ transplant, a life-saving organ transplant, based solely on the fact that they use medical cannabis. Uh, that issue, by the way, is very real in the state of California. One of our members actually died having been removed from the list and died before he could get back on. So it's definitely a, a, a serious issue in California. And I think these are uh, some of the issues you're going to see nationwide uh, where state laws don't specifically protect patients' rights. So that is my very quick impromptu California update. And now I want to uh, introduce to you our next speaker. Um, I see we're not exactly in order, but that's okay. Uh, I'm like, our next speaker, he's not there. Uh, Matt Allen from Massachusetts. Matt's the executive director of the Massachusetts Patient Advocacy Alliance, uh, which advocates for medical cannabis patients in the state, and he is currently a, in the graduate deg degree program in urban and regional studies at Northeastern University. Matt. Thank you, Don. Hello, folks. Um, as Don said, I'm the director of the Mass Patient Advocacy Alliance, so uh, we're a single-issue medical marijuana advocacy coalition that was formed in 2009. Here's a picture of some of our advocates um, out in front of a hearing that was held about a year ago. Uh, we passed an initiative in 2012, and then there was a, a process of several hearings around the state uh, that were based on developing regulations, and here's some advocates that were participating in, in one of those hearings. There we go. So I just want to give you a little context for, for how we got where we are right now. Um, we founded the group in 2009, as I said, to focus solely on uh, promoting safe access to medical marijuana as opposed to any other uh, issues related to cannabis. In Massachusetts, there hadn't be, been a group to focus solely on this issue until we founded the Mass Patient Advocacy Alliance. One of the things we were able to do was sort of change the dialogue or the perception of the issue as a whole uh, up in the legislature by bringing together a coalition of public health groups, including groups like the AIDS Action Committee, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, the Mass Nurses Association, the ACLU, the Mass Bar Association. Um, and when we uh, found the group in 2009, we were in the middle of the legislative session. So it wasn't until 2011 that we actually got to participate in a public hearing and show uh, this coalition of support from the public health community. And uh, we also brought forward about 30 patients at that time who had uh, compelling symptoms and uh, really made a strong case for moving things forward. But like a lot of other states, we continued to face uh, obstruction in the legislature, even though we lobbied all the committee members and, and got a majority of support in the Public Health Committee. Uh, the leadership was still not behind us. So it wasn't until um, we were able to get funds to run a ballot initiative that we were actually able to uh, pass the reform. And that, as I said, happened in 2012 through January uh, and May of uh, 2013. Uh, there were seven hearings around the state. We had two workshops and several conference calls to look at the issue of developing regulations for the program. Um, the ballot initiative itself was just about five or six pages. And we were looking at 50 pages of regulations that were addressing such issues as what is a 60-day supply, what is a bona fide physician-patient relationship, uh, meaning uh, what rules are in place for patients that are going outside of their primary care physician to seek a medical marijuana recommendation. 
one big issue that we fought hard on was to make sure that there was going to be access for pediatric patients on the first draft of the regulations that uh, would not have been permitted, and we were able to organize and change that. Um, there were also efforts to re uh, restrict the list of covered conditions, and again, uh, by bringing patients forward, we were able to uh, uh, organize to, to ensure that the ultimate decision about what is appropriate medical marijuana use would be made uh, between doctors and patients and not uh, linked to an arbit arbitrary list. So some of the things we learned through that process um, was, first of all, you know, beyond passing the law, and this is, I don't think, any surprise to anyone here, uh, having a group in place to focus on implementation and focus on those regulatory issues. And for us as well, uh, the implementation phase includes a lot of outreach to local governments. Um, we've had advocates participating in zoning hearings across the state. We've got 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and so using the Medical Marijuana Initiative campaign as sort of a capacity builder uh, to build advocates who could later be deployed uh, to address local issues, regulatory issues, and as well we've been active uh, resisting about 12 bills at the State House uh, that have been put forth to sort of roll back the initiative. And I would say um, there were some sort of highlights when our group has been, been, been uh, stronger in terms of uh, um, ownership by patients, the number of people involved, um, the feeling among the medical marijuana patient community that uh, um, their concerns are being heard. We, one kind of uh, benchmark for us was in 2010 uh, when ASA came out and helped us run a community workshop. We had about 70 patients come out and we developed consensus about what, what were the priority for patients in the legislation, brought that back to the state house and used those conversations as the basis for our conversations with legislators. And I think at that time there was a lot of excitement in the patient community and a strong feeling uh, that folks' concerns were being heard, which led to more buy-in and more uh, participation in advocacy. When we drafted the ballot initiative, it was sort of a different process where a lot of it was done behind the scenes. And that was, that was a little bit of a struggle for some patients in the community uh, because it was not an open process where all voices were heard. So through the initiative campaign, we ha then had to go back and work with patients to bring folks back into the fold. And when we did these, uh, organized for the seven hearings around regulations, we had about, we had two workshops, actually three workshops in different parts of the state where we went through page by page of the regulations and heard from patients what, about what their concerns were. We drew from that to develop priorities, and then we had several conference calls to get everyone on the same page. And, um, you know, it's a time-consuming process, but that as well definitely increased the strength of our organization. And uh, it resulted in about 100 people coming out to these uh, uh, hearings on the regulations. Um, a very impressive show of patient strength that actually changed the dialogue within the Department of Public Health. I mean, up till then, I think there was some reluctance within the state agencies to even address the issue because they didn't understand how, uh, how intensely it affected patients. And through that process, we were able to change those, those, uh, those minds and hearts, uh, but also increase the strength of our organization and lay the groundwork to have folks uh, who are prepared uh, to work on advocacy at the state house and at the local level. So right now, the actual state is that we're kind of in a gray area. We passed the medical marijuana law, like I said, in 2012. And right now, we still don't have any dispensaries licensed to operate. We still don't have a registration system up uh, for patients to send their registrations to the state and get ID cards. So there's a lot of confusion. We actually included in the law a deadline that the dispensaries should be licensed by January 31st, but things have become highly politicized and uh, we're running a little bit behind. Right now how it works is basically patients can have a written recommendation and they can show that to law enforcement. It should offer protections for, uh, from prosecution by state authorities, but patients still don't have a real way to, to get medicine. So some, some other lessons learned, um, grow your own is essential. We included that provision in the initiative, uh, specifically uh, around concerns about cost. Um, if there's one thing I could change about uh, some of the language we include, include in the initiative, we should have specified that each caregiver can grow for up to five patients because what happened is the Department of Public Health restricted that so caregivers can only grow for one patient. So right now, 
if we had a five to one ratio, we could have sort of an existing system where patients could uh, access the medicine, but because that regulation was restricted, we basically don't have a functional system right now until the dispensaries get open. And uh, just in, in closing, I would say this kind of revolves around the, the, the problem that we all face where the public debate around medical marijuana really isn't about how this is a medicine that, that patients need, but it's all about the hazards and the dangers of this drug. One a final point I would make uh, is something to keep an eye on related to that perception of the issue. Uh, we saw a lot of the dispensary applicants indicate that uh, they were going to prevent diversion of the medicine by making sure it was priced higher than the black market. Um, this is something that is, you know, flies in the face of what we've been trying to do when the state responded to our concerns about cost saying, well, don't worry, we'll require these dispensaries to subsidize low-income patients, but looking at the applications, you know, the subsidies are, are not that significant. So this is going to continue to be an issue uh, uh, moving forward. So that's where we are right now in Massachusetts. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Matt. Our next speaker is from Washington State, Carrie Boiter. Uh, Carrie was ACE's 2013 Activist of the Year. Uh, she's also a, a former broadcast journalist, a legislative assistant in Washington, and volunteers with everybody, it seems. We've got uh, ACE of Washington, the Steering Committee, the November Coalition, and the Seattle Hemp Fest. Carrie? Hi, everyone. So I have the pleasure of living in Washington, where we are trying to have uh, medical marijuana succeed along with a uh, adult use market, uh, which presents a unique set of challenges. Um, so for a little bit of a historical perspective, um, we passed our initiative in 1998. Um, and what that did was it said that uh, if you had cancer, AIDS, MS, glaucoma, epilepsy, or intractable pain specifically, then you could possess a 60-day supply of medical cannabis without uh, facing any uh, prosecution. Um, and it was actually in the initiative that this was humanitarian compassion necessitates. Uh, the passage of this measure. So it was, to, you know, definitely out of compassion that our voters were passing this. Um, and then we went 10 years without any real action at all in the legislature, which would indicate that there were no problems, that this was going along just fine, there weren't any real issues. Um, and then 2008 came along, and that was the first time that we um, took a close look at this law and started to try to put some parameters around uh, what the medical program would look like. And the Department of Health was tasked with defining a 60-day supply of medical cannabis. And so they went through and they had some extensive hearings from all sides of the issue, and they determined that 99 plants and 72 ounces is what would constitute a 60-day supply. And they were about to release this in a formal recommendation, and of course the police chiefs and the prosecutors weighed in, and they did not like the idea of this at all. Um, and so at that point in time, our patients said, okay, you know, we can make some compromises. Um, and so everybody agreed at that point that 15 plants and 24 ounces would be a 60-day supply. Now, 24 ounces is the most liberal uh, limit on a, a medicine supply in the country, um, but we had extensive input from a lot of doctors, um, dosing papers that were written by them, uh, explaining why we needed such a high amount. And, and as I explained, 72 ounces is where they originally started. So imagine what that would look like if we had actually been able to have that as a model for the other states. Um, the next big thing that came along was 2011 and Senate Bill 5073. Up until this point, we didn't have any real mechanism for access. You had to grow your own, and if you were too sick to, to do so, you had to find somebody to do it for you, um, which was very difficult to do, and it still is actually pretty difficult to find somebody to truly uh, grow for you without uh, having any sort of commercial model there. Um, and so this passed through, they uh, made a legal framework for producers, processors, and dispensers, and it passed both chambers of the legislature, and three days later, the U.S. attorney weighed in. And she said that any state employee who was to license these entities uh, would be liable for prosecution. Um, and so the governor vetoed 38 of the 56 sections, uh, leaving us with quite a mess for our law. And that's where we were um, when we started. One of the sections that was left behind uh, was collective gardens. And that was actually intended for very small groups of patients who were pooling resources. There was no commercial activity, no sales of any kind. Um, but because the commercial provisions for producers, processors, and dispensers were vetoed, um, that left these businesses in an area where they had to find a way to be legally protected, and their lawyers went to work and found the collective garden model as a way that they could still exist. And so
so that's how um, these dispensaries became collective gardens as we see them now. Um, so the city of Seattle stepped in once the governor vetoed this law, and they made regulations thems themselves. And we partnered uh, with the city of Seattle as well as the community to come up with our own regulatory framework. And we were leading the way for um, city by, on a city by city, county by county basis, much like California. Um, and so at this point then is when the DEA way, uh, stepped in. And they sent cease and desist, cease, cease and desist letters, um, which we know is one of their favorite tactics now. Um, it doesn't get a whole lot of media coverage, not very sexy, so they can kind of shut a whole lot of people down without anyone even paying attention. Um, and we had these champions weigh in saying things like, uh, there's, you know, the feds are saber rattling and they should get off our backs, we're doing this right. Um, and, uh, you know, they jumped to our defense. And this was great. It was really reassuring, and it kind of kept some of these businesses, gave them some protection at that point. Um, and so with all of this going on, the voters decided, we're fed up with this. Let's just go ahead and legalize it outright. And that was done with the promise that legalization would not impact the medical marijuana program. And so at that point, we passed it. That was 2012. And we started the implementation phase. And we hired this firm, Botech Analysis Corporation, who came in to study how to do this right, since nobody had really done it before. And we paid them almost a million bucks to come up with all of their great ways to do this. And so they advised us that one of the biggest threats to 502 working was the illicit market. And that included the gray market that is medical marijuana. And so it's pretty difficult to rein in the illicit market when you don't know where it is or how it exists. But medical marijuana, on the other hand, is all above ground. So it's really easy to bring that market into 502. And this is where um, Botech led the way for medical marijuana to suddenly be viewed as competition to legalization instead of a stepping stone to legalization. So now instead of partnering with the larger drug reform movement, we were competition, especially to the businesses. And so the voting public wouldn't just go along with wiping out medical marijuana to make legalization work easier, they had to come up with a way to sell this to people. And so we started seeing this bold-faced lie being circulated about how people don't look sick, so they must, must be fakers, and 90% of medical marijuana is really just recreational marijuana, and 99.2% are nothing more than a criminal enterprise. So we're like, whoa, back this train up. We need to go back to our champions. And... Uh, we go to them, and all of a sudden, their message isn't, we're doing it right, stop the saber rattling, it's, this is largely unregulated. Stop doing the wink and nod and just get rid of the sham. And MMJ, well, it's publicly viewed as a lie, so we don't need it anymore. And why was this? Again, because the voters were not going to wipe out medical marijuana to make legalization work. So now we get to 2013, and the recommendations that the legislature asked for from a work group made up of the Department of Health, Liquor Control Board, and the Department of Revenue. And they weighed in, and they wanted to ratchet down our 60-day supply to a one-week supply of six plants and three ounces. They wanted to take our designated providers down from a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, two-to-one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. Um, they wanted to make a registry that's mandatory. We don't have a registry now. Commercial access would go through the 502 market only. Sales tax exemption, maybe if we're lucky, but excise tax, definitely we got to pay that. Um, and we need to restrict the doctor-patient relationship. And there were a lot of very powerful forces weighing in against patients. Uh, we had, you know, legislators, of course, bipartisan effort in both chambers to do this, to adopt the recommendations outright. We had the agencies weighing in, each a powerhouse into, the, into and of themselves. We had um, the governmental agencies, police chiefs, prosecutors, all the typical medical association. And then we had the industry. We had people who were medical producers, like the Coalition for Cannabis Standards and Ethics, who now were applying for 502, and there was overlap, but they, they just wanted both systems to work. We had other um, largely 502-based uh, groups that didn't necessarily view medical marijuana as competition. And then we had the producers and processors who wanted to wipe out collectives completely because, you know, it's much easier for us to get our piece of the pie if we don't have to compete with them. Uh, and then, of course, there was the individual applicants who just had some money to burn and wanted to buy lobbyists of their own. And then representing the patients was ASA. 
and another group, which dubbed themselves the Red Shirts. Uh, and they dubbed themselves that because they wore red hooded sweatshirts to the Capitol every single time they were there. And they were known for giving death threats to lawmakers, which really made our side of the conversation quite difficult. Um, and noticeably absent, not weighing it at all, were professional organizations like the nurses, naturopaths, pharmacists. Criminal defense lawyers were not there as they tried to repeal our affirmative defense. Religious organizations, nonprofit advocacy groups, all the people that had backed us up before were nowhere to be found. So we had to make some compromises. And, you know, we were able to quite accomplish a lot. Uh, we managed to preserve the 15 plants if you had doctor approval. We uh, got additional limits for things like solids and liquids. Um, the registry was made voluntary, and we carved out some space within that 502 system. We agreed it could be a single system if they really made sure medical marijuana would work within it by creating licensing for these retail outlets only, increased canopy for high CBD medicines, limited cooperative cultivation. This isn't business. This is what collective gardens were originally attended for. And we did agree to some restrictions on the doctor-patient relationships. And then we got to the house where all of a sudden, the only thing that mattered was money. And it was money that hasn't even come into the state yet. Who's gonna get the money? Is it gonna be the cities and counties or is it gonna be the state? And how much of the money are they gonna get? And this whole debate about the dollars that have not even been created yet is what stopped us dead in our tracks in the final 48 hours. And so we were left with nothing again for the 15th year in a row. Federal intervention. Now, all of a sudden, we had, back in 2011, when she weighed in, Jenny Durkin saying state employees are not immune from prosecution. She weighed in again after the new coal memo was issued, as the rest of the states were saying, green light for commercial uh, activity. And she said, well, the continued operation of unlicensed for-profit entities is not tenable. Not tenable. That became the push and the cover to try and regulate us out of existence. And then she had the nerve the day after we didn't regulate this, after we didn't pass the regulations, to say, well, it's not the Fed's job to insert itself into the state legislative process. Really? You could have fooled me. But she actually said the really scary thing is that dispensaries are not legal. Every dispensary that is operating is an illegal business. And she said it loud and clear, and that is where we're left today. Uh, no closer to regulated medical marijuana in a state where we have legal, highly regulated medical marijuana, or adult-use adult marijuana, and the world is watching us, and they want to see what we're going to do, and we're going to be a model for the rest of the country, and wouldn't it be a sad irony if patients had to suffer, or they had to pay more, or they had to go without, all so that legalization can be made to work better? We need to tread really carefully as we do this, and we need to remain partners, working together. These are not competitive interests. They are complementary, and they will work together, and that is how we will wipe out the illicit market and end prohibition. Thank you, Carrie. Our next speaker uh, comes from Maine, uh, Tim Smale. Tim is the co-founder and executive director of Remedy Compassion Center in Auburn, Maine, and he also serves on several of the committees with the American Herbal Products Association. Tim? Thank you, Don. It's coming. Okay, great. In the meantime, I'll get started, and we'll let the uh, audiovisuals catch up in just a moment. But I am Tim Smale from Remedy Compassion Center in Maine. We, uh, I am a medical cannabis patient and have been, um, well, legally, ever since I've been able to use, le use it legally. But I found out about this about 10 or 12 years ago, quite by accident. And then I contacted this gentleman and four others and worked for a company called Canby out in Oakland for a period of time. And then Maine came about and had a dispensary permit application to allow for dispensaries in the state. Um, so we came back to our home state in Maine and applied for one of the dispensaries and, uh, and got a license. So my wife, Jenna, who does all the work and I take all the credit, is with me. But uh, she's our operations manager and is responsible for the grow of the operation, uh, as well as all of the uh, production that we do. But uh, whether I have a slide presentation or not is immaterial. I'll just go ahead and continue on from memory. Um, and if we catch up, that's great. Um, we started our program back in 19, I'm sorry, two, uh, 1999 was the first law that was passed to allow patients to have medical cannabis as a grow 
to allow caregivers to grow up to uh, five plants for six patients. And the program kind of went along kind of successfully, I guess you could say, is to the extent that it could without any distribution in the state until such time um, passed, a law passed in 2009, rather, a referendum by people in the state to allow for a distribution system to be set up. And that distribution system took the form of eight dispensaries that the Department of Health and Human Services set up a bid permit uh, to operate. Four of the dispensaries are run by one company, Wellness Connections of Maine. Uh, Becky uh, is the executive director. She's in the room with us today. And the other four are um, run by independent operators. Um, a couple of features of the program in Maine is that we, we did open up this program under uh, the very same kind of constraints that you all faced, and we kind of face a little bit today, but not as much, and that's the federal government. Ten days before we opened, we received our own letter from U.S. Attorney Tom Delahante uh, promising that if you go ahead and do this, to pack your toothbrush and bring clean, toilet, uh, clean uh, you know, <laughs> undergarments, because you probably are going to spend some time in jail. And that's what we anticipated when we opened up our doors. Uh, there were television cranes in our parking lot the morning we opened, and I anticipate that was the media um, for the law enforcement showdown that never happened and never has happened since we've opened. We've, under, we've operated under the most uh, regulated conditions that exist in the United States for can, uh, medical cannabis, uh, any place. One of the most stringent uh, things that we have, and I'm going to focus on this for a moment, is we're going to talk about regulation kind of run amok a little bit, and I'm going to talk about pesticides use. Normally when we talk about pesticides, we kind of run a little bit scared. We're thinking DDT, we're thinking all kinds of other things. But take a walk through any grocery store and you'll see the myriad of products available on the grocery store shelves. Most of us wouldn't come close to using those products, but uh, some of us uh, have used those products from time to time. And for the most part, uh, we find that the best medical cannabis grows are without inputs whatsoever, without products. But when you do have to use something to control your pest, as if you're growing apple trees, they don't put sprays on apples, they put sprays on trees prior to the growing of apples. So there's a whole method, there's a whole process to be learned from uh, other industries when we look at agricultural uh, growing of uh, medical cannabis. Our state took it to the furthest limit. We had a, lo a law that said no pesticide shall be used. And for the first couple of years of the program, we assumed that that was no harmful pesticides, and the state visited us regularly. Um, but uh, a new uh, regulator came in, uh, somebody who took the job from somebody else, and said, no pesticides, that means no pesticides. A couple of other developments happened in our state to, to force the issue, but what happened is that the state came in hard and fast, and our Board of Pesticide actually comes in and pulls plants and inspects those plants for any pesticides. They'll, they'll do a test of some 126 different products to see if we're using those on our plants, and if we do, we'll use our license. Well, that's a little tough to grow without any inputs whatsoever in medical cannabis. I urge you to try it. For the thousands of patients that come to our door, uh, it's very difficult for us to keep up after that environment because we're 100% vertically integrated. We buy nothing from the outside. We grow 100% of what we sell ourselves, each dispensary, and we make our own products as a result of it too. So it's very difficult to get to that point. Um, the slides will show that a little bit later if they, if they do catch up, but there's something that we got passed um, just last year was the ability to use what is called 25B products. The federal government has this classification of products, uh, FIFRA, 25B products, they're called, and they're, they're, they're so harmless that they, a tolerance has not been established uh, for these products. We're talking things like, you know, uh, lemon juice and a few other things. They're very ineffectual. They don't work on cannabis whatsoever. However, they smell very nice. So that's about the point that we got to uh, in, our, in our state so far, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough. Now, we have built such a, a lot of credibility, and that's the benefit of regulation, is that you get a chance to work with your regulators, awful lot. <laughs> and we've built up a lot of credibility by all of their visits and they're all of the times that they've come in and they've tested our plants and they've seen that we're living up to what we say we're going to do. So based on that, what we have now is a law that we got passed in this current emergency session, which is, uh, oh, that's okay, I'll just go without it um, at this point. At this, so what we've done is we've got a, um, a law passed in this session where we have now the ability to use uh, some products only if the federal government has given us approval uh, for those. The EPA has some uh, administrative 
uh, oversight over this. So what we're doing now is going to the EPA administrators, we're going to our congressional offices, and the regional EPA administrator that we have has oversight over all of New England. And if we can get them to uh, understand that this plan is actually a plant, they have not determined that it's a plant, an herb, or anything, they can't figure out exactly what it is. But if they deem that it is a plant, then we can use inputs, we can use these products on the plants. Uh, if they deem it's an herb, then we can use inputs on, on this as an herb. So to make a long story short, it's a small state. We have uh, less than uh, one 1% one of the, I'm sorry, less than one half of 1% of, of all of the adult folks in the state, current patients. So we don't have a whole lot of patients in the state right now, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12,000. But we're blazing the trail on issues like this, on the use of inputs in uh, medical cannabis grows. And there'll be a lot more to learn from this later, but uh, I think a little states like Maine that have, have a lot of regulation, it gives us one example of the pendulum has swung all the way to one side. There are good benefit outcomes for all of us though, because once we come out of this, we'll be able to news, use uh, what's safe to use on cannabis and we'll be able to tell everybody else about those. That's all for Maine, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Our next speaker comes from New Mexico. Lynn Goodman is the owner of the New Mexican Natural Medicine and was the first operator permitted uh, for a storefront dispensary in that state. He's also a founding board member of the National Medical Cannabis Industries Association and uh, works with the American Herbal Products Association as well. Lynn. Let's see how we do this. I've never done this before. What do I do on this thing? can't see much. That one? Oh, great. Yeah, just generally point it up. Okay. So. Button on the right, yeah. All right, so the, the first one of these I tried. Um, yesterday we had two flights to make, so I wrote my presentation, and I realized that if I spoke very, very quickly, I could do it in half an hour. Uh, so I redid it, and then realized if I spoke very, very quickly, I could do it in 20 minutes. Um, so one, I don't want to speak quickly, and two, I don't want to speak for 20 minutes. So uh, this is the abbreviated version, and hopefully we, we, we deal with it okay. Uh, brief history, Linen Air and Compassionate Use Act was passed in 2007. That was a process that began under Governor Johnson's second term in 1998, uh, working with legislatures and policy groups. Drug Policy Alliance was very strong in this. Um, eventually got passed. It didn't pass in, in Johnson's second term or Richardson's first term, but we got it through uh, in his second term. Uh, the regulations were promulgated two years later in 2009. Uh, these included patient registry, uh, licensed, licensed nonprofit producers. Oh, let me back up. So here's what the statute said. Statute was very, very simple. Statute said there are people who need medical cannabis, these are the conditions that are approved right now. If a doctor recommends it, somebody's going to create a registry, uh, that, and, and we needed to create a system to uh, allow new conditions to come in, and that the regulatory agency had to come up with a cultivation system and a distribution system that would give all patients in New Mexico safe access to safe medicine. They assigned that to the Department of Health. So that's a statute, and that's all the statute says. Right, so the Department of Health has a mandate to create regulations. So they spent about two years trying to do it, and the original thought they had, this is great, the original thought was what we could look in hindsight and call the Uruguay plan. Right? New Mexico was going to farm. Right? The Department of Health said, well, let's just put a big farm down in the southern part of the state where uh, we have an agricultural university. Let's just grow this stuff, and we'll open up little health care centers around the state, and we'll distribute it. So that was, that was the original concept, till the Attorney General said, I just want to point out one thing. The feds say you're going to get arrested if you do it, and I want to let you know that New Mexico state law says that if a state employee is charged with a federal crime, the state does not defend. So you guys are going to be on your own. And they said, uh-oh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to put ourselves at risk. Let's sign some other people who are willing to uh, face five and ten year mandatory minimum sentences. And we said, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Great. So they created, they created a, a, a series of a layer of stuff. Uh, patients, uh, 
are allowed to grow for themselves. They have to request a personal production license, a PPL, but so long as you're not an absolute idiot filling out that application and saying you have locks on your doors and nobody can see it, uh, your grow from the road, you can have a license. Patients are allowed to grow 16 plants. By the way, New Mexican Natural Medicine is basically patient-operated. Uh, all of us uh, in, the, in management of it, my wife, who's my partner in it, who's our administrative director and financial officer, uh, my son-in-law, Carlos, and daughter-in-law, Jennifer, who are cultivators, my son, Eli, who runs distribution, um, and other daughters working in the business. So we have about 20 employees, but the key people who are running it are all patients. Actually, one exception. Um, and it's not me. So what do we got? Personal production, 16 plants, four mature. That's four females in flower. Every patient can do that. Um, then they license nonprofit producers. It's a vertical system. So when you get a production license as a producer, you cultivate, you manufacture, you distribute. Uh, the second set of rule changes allowed for transfer between producers. There's no transfer between patients, right? If a patient is growing, it's for their use only. The law actually implies that if you pass a pipe or a joint to the patient next to you on the couch, you're violating the regulations. It's absurd. And nobody does that, right? Um, so we had a limited plant count. We went into it of 95 plants. They were concerned. A lot of the original regulations were geared to cater to law enforcement. And law enforcement's concern was diversion. Um, the state had a concern with mandatory minimum sentences, thought that if we were under 99, we'd be OK. Even though that was a cumulative, it still is a cumulative count. And since we're reporting every quarter, what our yields are, what our sales revenues are, how many plants we've harvested, we are all way over 10-year mandatories, should the feds go crazy again and decide to do that. Um, we started out with, I think it was six approved conditions. The Medical Advisory Board has increased that to uh, 17. They, the Medical Advisory Board has created it's a series of six doctors. These guys recommend anybody who wants to twice a year can present a petition for a, a new condition, claiming it for, they, you can be a patient, claiming your own need. You can be a doctor, claiming on behalf of a patient. Once they, it, once they hear that testimony, they, they can make a recommendation. If they recommend the condition, it goes to the Secretary of Health. And I realize I am talking fast, aren't I? Uh, okay. It goes to the Secretary of Health, and it's totally in the Secretary's discretion whether that condition is approved or not. Uh, we, we're hitting, I think, probably about two out of three that are recommended actually get through. So we have about 17 conditions and it's, it's slowly getting wider. Alzheimer's will be presented in a couple of weeks at the next Medical Advisory Board, and we're hoping it gets through. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so the 95 plants, we were able to get that up to 150. Uh, December 31st, 2013, we got that up. That's still very limited. Um, it's extremely limited. We have about 11,000 patients in the state. We have 23 licensed producers right now. Uh, how you manage your plants, what your cultivation decisions are, uh, affects what your yields can be. There are producers producing as little as uh, 8,000 grams a year, still with 150 plant count, under very few lights. There are producers who are producing uh, 175,000 grams a year, all within 150 plant count. Okay, what happened? We have a supply shortage. That shortage has been in place since day one. The basic position of law enforcement, which was accepted by the department, the theory was keep the supply sufficiently less than the demand and you won't have diversion, right? That's great. There's no diversion. But it also means patients don't have access to medicine. So for the sake of protecting the fear of diversion, we sacrifice patients' needs. That's been the policy since day one. It's never really changed. We've been arguing that there's a severe shortage um, for four years now. Department of Health has a statutory obligation to provide sufficient supply. So the only response they could make to our telling them this is to say, no, that's not true. There's no supply shortage. We've talked to patients. It's OK. So they maintained a state of denial. They couldn't hold on to it any longer, so they decided to commission a survey to prove us wrong. 
So they invested in an independent survey that was asked for in January 2013. We got the results in November 2013. Guess what? We were way off, way off. The, the, uh, the survey showed that licensed producers were producing, that patient needs were 5 million grams. They did a patient survey to come up with average usage. Multiply by the number of patients, they came up with 5 million grams. Um, this is based on data that's almost a year old now. Most of this was over the summer uh, of 2013 that the statistics were gathered, and it's now changed. But, and it's, it's worse. So uh, they came up with 5 million grams. They said producers are producing a million, uh, and that was a solid statistic because that's reported to DOH, uh, and that patients with personal production license were producing a million. That may or may not be accurate, but it's okay. It left them with a 3 million gram shortage, and that's the problem they're wrestling with now. Um, the question was how to deal with it. They've come up with, and this is soft because they haven't published it yet, but they did do, DOH did do a, a public announcement that they're going to ad address the shortage by increasing the plan count from 150 total to 150 mature plus 300 seedlings. Maybe I have another slide here. Yeah. Okay, so 300 seed, 150, 300 total of 450 plants. They are also saying that they will open up the application process again, which has been closed for four years when the, uh, Susanna Martinez campaigned to become governor, which she won in 2010. She ran on a platform of eliminating medical cannabis. She tried to do that in her first term, in her first legislative session. She failed. She realized the resistance was so strong. There's no government thrust to get rid of it. What there is is a thrust to restrict it, which is why we were able to push through an increased plant count and bring the number of producers up to 25. Uh, Richardson realized that nothing was going to happen for at least four years, and he better pump it up, which he did. And uh, to his credit, we're far ahead of where we would be if he hadn't done that. So, um, what's 150 plants going to, mature plants going to do for us? It will at least double our production, at least. Uh, what we're faced with right now is uh, maximizing 150 plants. So, on a rotational system, you, you harvest 10 plants, you load the 10 plants that have been in veg, and you start 10 new cuttings. It means those first 10 cuttings you make are the ones you've got to load. There's no way to select the most robust plants, the best plants. We load what we got. This is a plant we'd like to pull up and throw away and say, no, 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 you're not going into flower. We have no choice. When we get the two to one ratio, we can go from 75 flowering plants right now to 150, but we'll also be able to be selective um, and the yields will be, go up as a result of higher quality loads. What it also means, though, is that we can sell plants, cuttings, clones to patients, which we can't do now. We're allowed to, but we can't dedicate 20, 30, 40 plants out of 150 and say these are going to be sold to patients on a rotating basis. We can't grow enough to supply our patients. We run out every single week. Um, that will allow us to set aside plants for, ve uh, for patients with personal production licenses. It will also allow us to do things like whole plant juicing. We want to set up a juice bar uh, in our distribution facility. We haven't been able to do that. Keep some veg plants there to juice on the spot for fresh, fresh whole plant juicing for people who want to use that curatively or just for general health. Um, so that's our hope that those rules have not been published yet. The regulatory process is they publish 30-day notice, public hearing, hearing officers report. They should have published that immediately because they know how severe the shortage is. They didn't. So the question is why, and the only answer we can come up with, they're being a little closed mouth, but we've gotten some indications. They're contemplating a lot of other rule changes, and those rule changes may or may not be good for patients and may or may not be good for producers. We have an administration who's adversarial. The folks running the Department of Health are, are, are good. They're committed. We work well with them, but orders from above uh, keep them very, very restricted. So the chances are that hearing will be contentious. <clears throat> they will probably, once we see what they are, we'll probably have to organize 
two or 300 patients to stand in lines at microphones to argue the rules. The hearing will probably be scheduled from 9 to 12, take until 6 o'clock at night before they can shut it down. That means the hearing officer's report will reflect uh, a lot of public comment that's not favorable. DOH has to go back to the drawing boards, take into account all of that will push off the plant count increase, which means the shortage will continue. That's probably, probably what we're facing. Um, okay, I guess I went to the next slide too soon. Uh, the other thing that happened in 2013, so that's the first thing, the survey and what it's gonna do for us. The second thing is adult use uh, was attempted <clears throat> um, there is no initiative process in New Mexico. It's got to come through the legislature with the exception of constitutional amendments. So some legislators, active legislators, got together and said, let's put a constitutional amendment on the ballot in November. The governor can't veto it. It's not a law. All it does is says this is going on the ballot. Uh, they weren't able to get enough traction to do that, to get that passed in the Senate, so it's not on the 2014 ballot. Uh, what happens in the future depends on the 2014 election. If Susanna Martinez is reelected, it's highly unlikely we will see anything for the next four years of any changes in the medical cannabis program or adult use. Um, the, the first possibility for trying a constitutional amendment again would be in the 2016 session for the 2016 ballot. That's a maybe. Uh, if uh, a Democratic candidate wins, two of the four in the who are running for the primary right now are very strong supporters of both medical cannabis and adult use. If the Democrats, if one of those two guys is a candidate and if they win, both of which are long shots, uh, we may see some positive changes legislatively in their four-year term. But that's a big question. What does that say? I can't read that. Sorry. <laughs> the other thing that's happening in New Mexico is really interesting to me. Big money is moving in, right? We're small, we have 10,000 patients with 23, 23 producers. Uh, it's been very small family, community, relationally based structure with a lot of cooperation. All of a sudden, very well funded, publicly traded companies on the over-the-counter exchange are coming in. They're seeking to take out uh, licensed producers, either to partner with them or take them over. Uh, all of which is a scheme, ultimately. It's a fine one, it's a fine business scheme. It's a roll up, roll up small businesses, package them together, build a publicly traded corporation with earnings and profits, which eventually will be taken over by a much larger public corporation, and everybody will make a great deal of money. Um, unfortunately, patients get left out of that equation. Right? They have nothing to do with that process, and it's not patient focused. Those moves are coming in now. Um, what else do we, is that it? Am I out of time? Yeah. yeah <laughs> okay. These are some things that we need to do for 2014. Greatest problem is patient access in rural areas. The uh, we're allowed one cultivation, one distribution. They're in a particular place. Large cultivators don't have enough of a patient base in a rural area, so they pull out of there. They move into the major urban areas. We need to address that. We've got to separate distribution and give us multiple facilities. We need more cultivation facilities, the present producers to, to capitalize on the plant count. By the way, most of us are considering going to greenhouses. If we get the plant count increase, New Mexican second location will be a greenhouse, half a plant still there. It's gonna be the only way we can get the yields and it's a major change in the carbon footprint. And I think that's it, they're throwing me out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. I promise we won't literally throw you out. <laughs> so th thank you very much. Our next speaker comes from Colorado, Josh Capel. Josh is a partner in the law firm of Vicente Sedberg, and he is the uh, associate uh, director of Sensible Colorado, which is the state's leading advocacy organization. Josh. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, you know, today I kind of want to focus on the state of Colorado's medical marijuana patients in the, in the post-legalization world. You know, as I'm sure you all know, on January 1st, recreational sales started in Colorado, and so we're about four months in. And, and so, you know, but I think before we really dive into the present, I think we have to take a, a quick step back. Um, you know, because there's some initial fears about legalization. There's fears, you know, w when people were starting to talk about legalization, we just created you know, arguably one of the most comprehensive regulatory systems in, in the country to distribute medical cannabis. And yes, there's many, many problems with it, but there's a lot of fears, 
that if we move forward with, you know, with legalization for all adults, that we poke the bear, that we lose the access that we have. There's also fears that you know, the marijuana that was grown in Colorado would be in short supply and that the people who needed it most wouldn't be able to obtain it and that the prices of marijuana would also go up. And there's also strategic fears you know, going on you know, with, legal, with the whole recreational conversation you know, that you know, does this sort of d distract us from our, you know, bringing medical cannabis to the other states? You know, you know, does it really set us back? You know, but our thoughts were different. Our thoughts were our current system was flawed. We didn't have access. People who had PTSD did not have access to medical cannabis. We tried. We filed petition after petition to the, to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Each time we were shot down. And there's people from out of state who wanted to come to Colorado to try medical cannabis, but they, they didn't have access to it. They couldn't you know, buy it from one of our stores. And then there's also politics. You know, the biggest concern, the biggest criticism we heard in Colorado was people were abusing our system. You know, they were they were just feigning being being sick so they could get so they could get high. And our thought was, well, if the voters of Colorado say that everyone can get high, they, their criticism's unfounded. And and so what happened? You know, not actually not much. You know, after you know, after you know, legalization passed in November, the same stores that were selling medical cannabis in October were still selling them in December. And those stores have been, you know, selling medical cannabis ever since. Um, but you know, some things did happen. Though. Um, we saw, you know, sort of, you know, more legitimacy and, you know, to the medical cannabis movement. And not saying it wasn't legitimate before, because it definitely is. But it it provided space where, you know, the the criticisms were now focused on recreational marijuana. And so we had space to to really push the ball forward to talk about issues that we weren't allowed to talk about before. And it became commonplace in sort of Colorado politics to. You know, you'd hear a lot of politicians say, I don't know about this recreational marijuana, but that medical cannabis, I'm all for it. You know, and, and you never saw that before. And so really, you know, it shifted the whole conversation about medical cannabis into the mainstream in a way that we never really saw. And it also accelerated progress on the federal level. We saw, you know, you know with the Department of Justice and the memorandums that came out, there's sort of non-enforcement policies. We saw, you know, issues with banking, you know, banking guidelines, and maybe, you know, maybe we'll see some sort of change on the banking front. And, and apparently, you know, just a couple of days ago, Eric Holder wants to talk about rescheduling now. And so, we, you know, we've seen, you know, our, politically we've seen, um, you know, sort of our hopes and dreams come true. And it's really been a sort of best case scenario. Um, and so when we talk about implementation, and you can notice my, my typo, it's supposed to be the world watches. You know, the biggest sort of issue we had with implementation was everyone was so focused on recreational marijuana that people forgot about medical cannabis. And I have to, you know, give a strong, strong shout out to Terry Robnett. Um, I think she's back there. She is um, probably one of the most professional, effective medical cannabis advocates in Colorado. And you know, she was persistent. You know, during the implementation process, the governor, you know, put together a a a, a task force of people from, you know, every single department he could possibly think of. He, they threw on this task force to sort of create guidelines of how they wanted to implement and implement recreational marijuana. And Terry was there every step of the way saying, don't forget about medical cannabis. You know, the rules that you're making for recreational marijuana, sure, I get it, but they don't apply here. And, and, and she was very, very key in that. And, um, and, and, that's, and I'll talk more about that. You know, I think that's sort of the biggest struggle in sort of this post-legalization world is, is to be seen. You know, is to be seen as the medical cannabis patient, not sort of get washed up in the fray. Um, but, you know, with our implementation, our medical law stayed the same. You know, so, you know, you know, the regulations that we had on the medical side, you know, we were very clear in Amendment 64 to not mess with them. That was definitely one of our strong concerns. But, you know, but with that said, you know, during this implementation process, the legislature and the regulators did kind of me meld the two together. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, on January 1st, 2014, when we had the first recreational sales, um, we wanted to make sure that we kept the focus on medical cannabis patients. And so, you know, you know we, the first person to buy recreational marijuana in Colorado was Sean Azarati, a veteran with PTSD, who was not allowed to buy it under our medical system. And so, you know, so that's where we wanted to keep the focus on. And, you know, really the implementation or the sort of rollout on, on January 1st was exactly how we wanted it to go. The headlines were people line up, buy some weed, go home, no big deal. And then that was exactly what we wanted. Um, but now, you know, you know how it works. You know how it works now with sort of the the, the medical 
cannabis stores and the recreational stores. There's really three different types of stores. There's you know, medi the, the medical cannabis only stores, the recreational stores, and then these dual use stores. And the, du and the dual use stores are, are really quite fascinating. You know, you walk in and you know, on one side you have medical cannabis, a wide, a wide variety, cheaper prices, no taxes. And on the other side you have recreational cannabis, not very much, very expensive, tons of taxes. And so we, what we actually saw was that a lot, of, um, a lot of people actually signed back up to the medical marijuana registry. We saw an increase in registered medical marijuana patients in Colorado you know, over the last four months. Um, and so to, to move, to, you know, to keep things moving forward, um, you know, some of the positive effects you know, was you know, you know, t the public health regulations. We have mandatory testing, mandatory labeling. You know, that's all being rolled out. Um, but some of the negative effects, there's still many challenges, and I think this is the most important piece to, to take away, is that with, um, you know, a lot of issues, a lot of regulations that sort of were knee-jerk regulation, or knee-jerk reactions by um, local governments and state governments, they didn't carve out space for medical cannabis. And so, you know, you saw, lo you saw local governments banning possession of marijuana in government buildings and parks with, with no sort of carve-out. And you saw attacks on recreational edibles, um, you know, with no carve out for medical cannabis patients. And you also saw, you know, there's issues with, you know, the drug endangered children is sort of like the new, you know, sort of push in the Colorado legislature now where they're trying to say, you know, if you, if you have children around, um, you know, if you have marijuana around your children, but they, you know, they, it's more broad than that, um, you know, that this is a crime. And no, again, no carve out for medical cannabis patients. Um, there's also crackdowns on, on caregivers, which is another, you know, another issue. Um, and so, you know, moving forward, I think that the biggest piece to take away is that, you know, we have to keep the focus on medical cannabis, you know, as states, you know, continue to legalize recreational marijuana. Um, the big conversation that's going to be happening in Colorado is where do people use marijuana at? I think, you know, the recreational and the, and the medical side of things are really in the same boat. People shouldn't be forced to use it at their house or if they're coming from out of town, they shouldn't be forced to use it in the parks. There's also, you know, the, you know, standardizing dosages, which people have talked about before. And then there's, you know, many other states and the federal government. There's tons of work to be done. And so thank you all very much. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker comes from Maryland, a neighbor here from Washington, D.C. Eric Sterling has over 32 years of experience as a lawyer working on medical cannabis issues. He's also the president of the Criminal Justice uh, Policy Project, uh, the leading organization that's educating the public about criminal justice and drug policy issues. Eric? Thank you very much. I want to thank Aza very much and congratulate you for your years of leadership and effective work in this area. Um, that has to be said because you've faced an enormous amount of competition and pushback from uh, others in our movement. I also want to commend Mike Lazuski and uh, Hunter Holman who have worked on, uh, with uh, the group in Maryland. Um, uh, the introduction should mention that uh, Governor O'Malley appointed me to the State Medical Marijuana Commission last fall, so I am a State Medical Marijuana Commissioner. Um, and to share with you that I, you know, I helped Bob Randall uh, and Alice O'Leary back in 1981 as they were starting the Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics and helped Cheryl Miller commit civil disobedience in the House of Representatives uh, to raise uh, attention to this issue. Um, I'm also delighted to be here because Maryland really isn't fairly considered yet a medical marijuana state. Um, we don't have any plants in the ground. We don't have patient protections. Uh, modern medical marijuana it goes back to 2000. Um, uh, Rob Campy and I met with a delegate uh, in an Italian restaurant to uh, talk about this. Uh, he introduced a bill. No action. This is Don Murphy in the center, a uh, Republican uh, delegate, um, and was very active around, going around the states uh, at MPP's uh, guidance and funding. Here he is with Dan Riffle and Karen O'Keefe many years later. Um, his constituent, Daryl Putman, uh, was a retired colonel in the U.S. Army with cancer. This is Daryl Putman. Uh, Putman said, look, you know, I served our country. Uh, why can't I use marijuana to treat my cancer? Um, 
His story was inspiring, 2001, a bill, uh, uh, no committee action. 2002, uh, again, no committee action, no Senate companion bill. It was Murphy's last year, but now he had 54 delegates, co-sponsors, and 147 member dele uh, uh, legislature. Um, here, quickly, some of the kinds of provisions uh, for mature plants. It was going to be operated by the Board of Physician Quality Assurance. Um, Patients not in the program could assert affirmative defense to a possession prosecution. Uh, it was amended, uh, this by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Joe Valerio. Essentially, uh, persons could offer evidence of a medical necessity, and if the court found that, then they could only be punished up to a $100 fine instead of a $1,000 fine or a year. Um, it passes the House of Delegates, 80 to 56. It's rejected in Senate. Wait a moment. How do I go back? Um, 2003, uh, Don Murphy's gone. Delegate Dan Morheim, a physician, introduces a bill, 56 co-sponsors. Senator Paula Hollinger, one of the most powerful senators, she introduces the bill in the Senate, brings 20 co-sponsors in a 47 Senate, 47 member Senate. And, you know, very key, you know, that these medical professionals are now the sponsors of the bill. And, Unfortunately, again, it gets amended down to what Valeria wanted, but it is signed by the Republican governor, Bob Ehrlich. Uh, 2011, continued pressure. Finally, we get a, a medical marijuana working group. The Secretary of Health is on the group. He fights against anything but research. They couldn't agree. There were different approaches. 2013, finally, there is a law. Governor says he would only accept the Secretary's plan. Um, this is Delegate Sh uh, Cheryl Glenn, a uh, strong driver uh, for this effort. Uh, her mother was a uh, uh, medical marijuana patient, Nat Natalie La Parade, and her name is given to the commission that's created when the governor signs the law. Um, law puts the program in academic medical centers. Um, statute provides a bunch of details. Um, there's not a limit on the number of conditions. Uh, lots of the fears of con addiction and diversion and so on. Um, approval by institutional review boards. Uh, annual license. Five programs, only five programs, but there are not that many academic medical centers. Um, patient information has to be given to law enforcement in real time. Uh, marijuana is either from the federal government or marijuana growers. Governor can suspend the program if there's a reasonable chance of prosecution. So then we be, uh, the commission is appointed. Um, did I skip one here? Yes. So there's a 12-person commission named. Uh, we're supposed to be up and running by July 1 this year, unlikely. Um, uh, I get named the chair of the policy committee. We begin drafting regulations in October. On February 27, we released an informal draft of regulations for informal comment. And th the thrust of these regulations, about 47 pages, very much follow the legislation, which makes it nearly impossible to operate. Um, we envision growers producing high-quality medication that would be suitable for immune-compromised patients. Uh, we don't need placebo-controlled requirements for the, for the research. Um, reflects the legislature's concerns. There would be identification cards. And um, we sort of try to dodge some of the limits by saying patients are construed to be part of the program and therefore they could buy marijuana from growers. Uh, the 2013 law is unlikely to work for these reasons. Uh, there's no economic way it can work. The academic medical centers, you know, they get lots of money from the feds. They're dependent on federal agencies. They're not going to take money for marijuana. Um, they're not going to handle it. That's a felony. Um, need to revise. We're in the middle of this right now. Um, uh, Senator Raskin uh, has been our leader in the Senate. This is a picture of him introducing uh, a bill to tax and regulate. Right now, uh, these things are being debated on the floor of the, of the, the legislature as we sit here. Um, growers had a lot of influence in the House of Delegates passed bill. They're going to eliminate the, limit the number to only 10 growers statewide, a five-year license. Senate passed bill modified this as of 5.30 p.m., they had not agreed on the new law. The session ends at midnight Monday. Uh, a bill is likely to pass. We're going to have a new governor. Perhaps there'll be a new health secretary. We hope to get regulations finalized in the fall. 
Um, so these are the complicated steps before patients are going to obtain medical marijuana in Maryland. There's a lot of regulation, a lot of review, all of the stuff that you've heard about from the other states. What's striking to me, the growers have already demonstrated political power. Uh, the most influential patient advocates have been the parents of children. Uh, the physicians, the healthcare professions are not active. There's still enormous need for legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. We actually have one more speaker who is not listed in your program, but I want to introduce uh, Ginny Storms. She's from New Jersey. Uh, she's a pediatric registered nurse, an advocate for medical cannabis, and the mother of a child who is using medical cannabis. Ginny. Thank you for having me. Um, I first want to thank all of you who have done this for the last umpteen decades to get to where we are today. I apologize for being so ignorant about medical marijuana in my own state as well as the United States. I can tell you I voted in 1996 for California when I lived there to become a legal state, and I've moved to New Jersey. I know why. Um, so let me tell you about New Jersey. Um, you all know that we have the wonderful Governor Christie, and he wants to be our president. So let me tell you about how he has single-handedly tried to wreck New Jersey's program, as I've experienced it. I do have a 14-year-old child who is a cardholder who needs medicine and cannot access it in the state of New Jersey. So when I found out medical marijuana can help my son, I looked into it, and this is what I discovered. In 2010, the legislature actually passed with the signature of Governor Corzine, apparently at 3 a.m. in the morning, as Governor Christie has informed me just the other day. Governor Corzine signed the bill and let Governor Christie inherit it. He was not happy. And what happens when Governor Christie is not happy? Um, <laughs> let's say that he has single-handedly tried to destroy this like he blocked the bridge. Um, he inherited the program. He has regulated it to death. He wants a strict medical program. The problem is he is creating a program that is not going to work, and it never will work the way it currently exists. Um, he originally wanted it to go through hospitals. Hospitals, Hospital-based programs aren't going to work for the reason that we just heard. It's very complicated, and it offers no compassion for those who are most in need. Um, he put in place in 2012 some regulations. Now keep in mind the program passed in 2010. He finally got regs out in 2012. He did not ask for, ask for information or how to implement this program with um, patient input, advocate, advocacy groups, including the Coalition for Medical Marijuana in New Jersey or the Drug Policy Alliance. I do not believe we have an ASA chapter, nor have, has anybody asked for help from them either. Some of the stupid regulations we have are that you must have a two ounce limit per month. That's it, two ounce. Um, he originally put in a three strain limitation. Dispensaries could not grow more than three strains at one time. Your THC limit could not exceed 10%. There's a mandatory physician registry, which is scaring away legitimate doctors who really know that this works as medicine, but do not want to be ostracized or somehow put on that list of people who should not be prescribing marijuana because it's an evil thing. Um, we all know different. Um, it also required fingerprint background checks of caregivers and patients. And you know the only thing they're checking for is drug conviction. So you could be a murderer and get your medical marijuana card in the state of New Jersey, but you cannot have drug offenses without proving rehabilitation. We also have a, a sales tax. Um, the state has supposedly set the price per ounce of $500 per ounce in an attempt to divert it from the streets. Is what it, Governor Christie is doing is he is actually creating an underground market that is much more profitable and much more affordable for those who are needed, who are qualified patients. Um, we have six, uh, six dispensaries that are approved. They all must be nonprofits without nonprofit status or benefits. Two are allowed in each region of the state, two in northern, two in central, two in southern. No home growing is allowed. The only forms you're allowed in the state of New Jersey is to smoke bud, eat lozenges, or to apply lotion to yourself. That's it. All testing is done by the Department of Health. There are very limited um, restrictions on what qualifies. Um, six, to be honest with you. If you have Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, terminal cancer, muscular dystrophy, IBS, Crohn's disease, or terminal illness and the doctor says you have less than 12 months to live, you may start the process of a three to 12 months process to get your card at a cost of around $1,000 to get your card, including the background check. And if you need a caregiver, they need a background check and they have to pay that $400 for the card, or $200 for the card as well. Um, if the patient is resistant to conventional therapy, we give you another three disorders. Seizures or epilepsy, which is where my child falls in, he has Dravet syndrome intractable skeletal muscular spasticity, and glaucoma. 
Additionally, if you have severe or chronic pain, nauseousness or vomiting, cachexia, wasting syndrome, and you have AIDS, you're positive for HIV, or you have cancer, then you may also apply. Um, very costly, very expensive. You have to go through a one-year process in establishing a relationship with a new doctor because none of the doctors who are currently treating you want to go on the registry. No changes are allowed until after the second annual report has been issued and progress is assessed with the program in New Jersey. So in 2010, we passed a law, regs were created, and we waited. 2010, we have, excuse me, 2012, December, we opened our first dispensary in northern New Jersey, Montclair. It's called Greenleaf. Currently, today, it's open one day a month. Hey, welcome to New Jersey. <laughs> um, in October of 2013, we actually opened up um, a dispensary down in southern Jersey. That one is the Compassionate Care Foundation in Egg Harbor. Um, they actually offer a discount to every client who comes in, so their medication is only $400 per ounce, and they're the cheapest in the state. December of 2013, in central Jersey, we opened up the Garden State Dispensary in Woodbridge, and they actually have a model in Colorado, and they, to date, have been the most successful, but we do have, between Egg Harbor and Woodbridge, two functioning, operational, open seven days a week dispensaries. In 2013, there was a conditional veto of a bill called S-2842. I was involved in that for my son. As, you, as I told you earlier, smoking was the only form, the only way I can give my son medication. My son can't smoke. He can barely talk. And he's on a ton of medications. He also uses oxygen. So we petitioned the governor to go ahead and let our children have the edibles. And actually, we, we petitioned for the patients, not the children. And he offered a conditional veto. And there was some accomplishments with that. He eliminated the, the three strain limitations. So no longer were dispensaries limited to three strains. Could you guys imagine having to choose between three brands? So that has been eliminated. But he limited edibles to minors only. So that's really important to realize that only minors. So once my son and other children turn 18, you have to now start smoking marijuana. It makes no sense. But that's what Governor Christie thinks. Um, he did retain the three unrelated doctors for minors. So in order for my son or any, any minor in the state of New Jersey to get medical marijuana, not only do they have to see a medical marijuana prescribing doctor from the registry, they also have to see a psychiatrist and a pediatrician. So I need three doctor recommendations. Talk about hiking up the price of that card. Um, January 2014, Governor Christie vetoed S-1220, which actually eliminated um, the opportunity for establishing as medicine marijuana in the state of New Jersey. It also would allow organ donors, I believe we had this um, come up in California, where it would allow the organ donors to be able to become recipients. Um, he vote, vetoed it. He also vetoed the hemp bill. Um, what we need in New Jersey is we need protection from arrest and access. We need safe hospital-based care. Um, we need to have the physician registry eliminated. We need to have honest regulations that actually are going to work. I can tell you my son has been kicked out of a hospital as a card holder for his medicinal marijuana use. I have a friend who was stabbed by his roommate and while they were investigating the crime of him, him being stabbed, he was arrested as a card holder for marijuana possession and the charges are still pending. Um, in New Jersey, our law is called CUMA. Um, currently, the Attorney General in New Jersey has only distributed those guidelines to the state troopers, not to the municipalities and the townships. Again, our program's costly, it's confusing, and it is just not working. Um, in 2011 and 2012, multiple patients did sue the state and the Department of Health for lack of access. I can tell you that to date, there is only one surviving um, complainant. And that's really sad. Um, the New Jersey courts denied to hear it. They sent it to appeals. That's where it's at now. And actually, in the state of New Jersey, the appeals court actually said and found New Jersey in, in failure of compliance with their own rules and regulations, it said that annually and biannually, they must issue a report on the status of it because that's the point where we can add new conditions. That's the point where we can actually start helping other people and adding what is needed and actually having a true medicinal program. So those actually came out in February, and since they're three years late, they're still refusing to add anything and, and accelerate the process of helping our soldiers with PTSD or other people who have qualifying conditions that really should have access to medicinal marijuana in our state. We do have currently le legislation. The two bills I mentioned that were vetoed in January are up again. Um, we do have a right to farm bill as well, which would allow home grow. As a mo single mother, 
I don't have $500 an ounce. That's $1,000 a month that I would have to spend to get his medication to save my son's life. And because medical marijuana program in New Jersey is not working, Senator Scutari just recently has actually presented legislation based on California and Washington, because no one wants to be like California, or excuse me, Colorado or Washington, um, highlighting the benefits of taxation. He actually feels that that's something that would work. And as a parent of a child who needs medical marijuana, I have a feeling it would work. Because then all of a sudden, no one's going to be looking at legalization and going, oh my gosh, what about that medical program? Because the medical program, like Colorado, is going to be forgotten. So yes, I am for legalization. Because you know what? Having that glass of wine repeatedly every single night for 10 times in that one night is much more dangerous than that single joint someone may want to smoke. And lastly, Senator Gusiora has put a voter referendum, and he's doing it through the legislature. In New Jersey, we like the legislators. Everybody has to go through them. It is actually Assembly Bill um, 2842. Ironically, the same exact number as the bill from last summer that was conditionally vetoed. And basically, if both houses of the legislature and the governor sign this, it will go to the voters of the state of New Jersey and let them decide. And it will allow for possession of less than one ounce of marijuana as a legal remedy in the state of New Jersey. So let's let the voters in New Jersey decide. Okay, thank you.